I tell people about that neighborhood church? And they're like, but what's the name? I'm like, no, that is, it's that neighborhood church. They're like, no, but what's, what's the real name? I'm like, no, that's, that's it. So uh, my, my blessing to be here with you guys. Um, this is my family. I'm just going to show you my family, introduce myself. My name is Justin. I'm the church planting director for Michigan and Northwest Ohio for, the, for this denomination. This denomination is the Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, that's my family. That's my wife, Anne. Adrienne is her full name. That's Annabelle, Sayla, and JD. You, you can't tell from the picture that JD, we, had, we, we fought tooth and nail just to get that one picture. We're like, what, what are you crying about? He's just crying the whole time. I just, I don't want to be on the, I just, and it was Christmas, and he still couldn't take a picture. Uh, so that's my family. Love my family. Uh, I met Pastor Pat because we planted a church at the same time. So I planted in West Michigan uh, while he was planting here. And so we kind of came up through the church planting struggle together at the same time, although he's got a lot more wisdom and years than I do. Uh, but we, we built a friendship that way. Uh, and so, so when I moved to Toledo, he was like one of the first people I called. I couldn't wait to, to build that relationship back up again. I sat with your team, the team of TNC, I don't know, a month ago, uh, we had tacos, although I kept on getting, they were like, it's carnitas, and I'm like, okay, it's a taco, it's all the same thing, uh, and we just ate these great carnitas, and we talked about you, really, all we, all we talked about was you, and they gave testimony, which is a God story, after God story about you, and how much they love you, and care for you, and what God is doing in your life, so I couldn't wait to preach. We're going to be in Jonah 4, Jonah 4, if you got a Bible, you want to turn there with me? Um, I got the privilege of wrapping up Jonah 4, although I thought that meant that I was wrapping up the series. I was like, oh, Pastor Pat really trusts me to wrap up the whole book with chapter 4. He's like, actually, I'm doing another sermon next week to wrap it up. So he didn't really trust me. He just getting back from vacation. That's really what, really what went down here, folks. Uh, Jonah 4, verse 1. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read a little chunk by little chunk, and then we're going, to, we're going to answer some questions. Because when I read Jonah 4, i got a ton of questions. And the first question comes at you right off the bat uh, because you're, you're wondering what he's mad about. Here's verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. So not only did it displease him exceedingly, but he's also angry. And you have to ask the question. It's good when you're studying the Scriptures to ask the question, uh, what's going on here? And ask God to answer those questions. So, so what is it that displeased him? And why is he mad exceedingly? Like, like Jonah is, you woke him up from a nap mad. Jonah is, you, you stole his cookie mad. And you have to wonder why. So I'm going to go back into Pastor Randy's message last week. Pastor Randy did a great job last week. Can we get up for Pastor Randy? <laughs> Pastor Randy was the first one to clap for that just now. By the way, he's like, let's get this going here, baby. Let's get this going it was an amazing sermon. All right. So let's go into his message in case you weren't paying attention at this very moment. This is the last part of chapter 3. Let's find out why Jonah's mad. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. So they repent, and he relents from raining down fire from heaven. To me, that seems like a good thing. That seems like a major win. The Ninevites, who are notoriously terrible people, uh, the, the king, I'll give you his name, Shalmanassar III, he's a notoriously evil king. Uh, him and all of his people, they turn their heart back to God. This to me sounds like a major win. An, an entire uh, staple country. Th these people are the people. Did you know this about Nineveh? I don't know, I don't know how much background and context you guys got so far in this series. But these are the same people that invented lock and key. These are the same people. They have a zoo, an ancient zoo. I mean, these people are, they're innovative. There's 120,000 of them. These people are the same people that invented the flush for your toilet. That's what they said about the Ninevites. They invented, I mean, they probably didn't have like a whole like flushing mechanism, but they figured out how to flush the toilet. I mean, that's a big, these are, these are an amazing group of people. The fact that they turn away from their evil and turn toward God is a, ma is a major win. Like, this is my job. My job is to wake up and try to turn people's heart toward God. I'm, I'm in full-time ministry. It's what I went to school for. It's what I get paid for. It's what I care about. It's what I wake up and go, I want to I turn an entire group of people's heart toward God. How do I do that? And he does this. And if I did that today, if I did that with America, 
I'd be on Oprah. I'd have a book deal. I'd be a lot richer than I am right now. It's not about the money, but the point is, it'd be an amazing win, right, for, my, for, for what I try to do every day. And yet, Jonah's mad. Why are you mad, Jonah? What, 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 let, let me just talk to you a little bit more about, about the Ninevites and just, just tell you how crazy this is. The Ninevites and, and Shalmanassar III are known for their plundering. Uh, and if you don't know that, maybe you've studied the Vikings at some point in your life. The Vikings are polarizing. Uh, the Vikings used to plunder. They used to conquer a city and then plunder, uh, meaning they would kill people. Sometimes they would take the kids for slaves. Uh, this is going to get real graphic here, but the Ninevites would actually light people on fire, and then for entertainment, they'd watch them burn. Uh, they would impale them with stakes and then line them up along the road. Uh, they would skin them. Uh, and if they wanted to leave people alive, what they would do, I told you this was going to get real, uh, <laughs> what they would do is they would cut off a limb or a finger or even a nose, and they'd let the person live as a testimony, don't mess with the Ninevites. That's how evil these people are. So the fact that Jonah comes, he's finally faithful, and they turn their heart toward God, it, it feels like we should be happy about this. It feels like we should have some joy about this. So, so why, is, why is Jonah mad? We're going to look at Jonah's heart tonight. Um, his heart is clearly selfish. He's childish. He's petulant <laughs> throughout this scripture. But most of all, his heart is absent of love. Now, you've been in church maybe before. Maybe this is your first time. Great if, it, if it's your first time in church in general. Church talks a lot about love. Maybe you're like, oh, he's going to talk about love. Here we go. Uh, but the church should talk about love all the time because it's like the one thing we're supposed to do. Like if, if you've read part of the Old Testament, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, there's, there's hundreds of laws, hundreds of them for us to be in good relationship with God and for us to be healthy people in relationship with God. And then Jesus comes and he wraps up the entire law in like this two-law taco. He, it's just like a... It's just two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We're just supposed to do one thing. Interact with God in this deeply loving relationship and then turn that love on other people. We're just supposed to do one thing. So that's why the church always talks about it because it's like we're supposed to do just that one thing. I don't know if you have kids. If, if you don't have kids, I always tell my kids to do one thing and they just don't seem to do that one thing. I'll tell my son, J.D., go, go clean your room. Okay, Dad, all right. Three hours later, did you clean your room? Well, Dad, I built, I built a castle with Legos. Uh, and then I liked that so much that I played Fortnite, and I built a castle on Fortnite. And then I liked that so much that I went and I built a f castle on Minecraft. And then I liked that so much, I watched a, a, a movie about a woman in a castle. It's called Tangled. Uh, and, and I'm calling today Castle Day. I'm like, oh, buddy, that's so creative. That's really great. Did you clean your room? No, that, that, that's complicated, Dad. It's complicated. Actually, it wasn't really that complicated. I just asked you to do one thing, and it's three hours later. It's not really that complicated. But this is what we do as followers of Jesus, don't we? He kind of asks us to do one thing, just one thing. It's love people from the right place in your God gut. Love people from the right place in your soul and mean it. Love them from good intentionality and, and mean it. He asks us to do one thing, and Jonah can't seem to do this here. He has this legacy of turning an entire people's heart back to God, but at the same time, it's kind of worthless because his insides are not good. So let me ask you tonight, and this is a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to answer this out loud, but are you loving people? And are you loving people from the right place in your gut? Are you loving people from a pure place? Are you loving people from a place that is intentional? Let's study Jonah a little bit more and find his true colors. And what we're going to do at the end of this is we're just going to study some ways that you know that your heart is a little bit rotten uh, and, and how to fix that. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Verse 2, 
And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That, that, that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God. He's angry about this. I knew you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from... This is what he's mad about. I knew you were gracious. I knew you weren't, you weren't going to rain down fire and I kind of really wanted you to. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. He's going to get real dramatic. For it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? God just handles it. Son, is this a good look for you? Should you be throwing a fit like this? He's mad that God is loving, that God is kind, that God is gracious, that God is slow to anger and he's abounding in love and that's really what's making him uh, upset and really on the inside he's hoping that God would just throw a few lightning bolts just a few lightning bolts on top of Nineveh just a few I don't know if y'all played Mortal Kombat but you can one of them just just a few of those fireballs I'm, I'm not asking for much and that's really what his heart looks like and again back back to one question is that what your heart looks like are you rooting for people are you rooting for people to find Jesus? Are you rooting for people to find love? Are you rooting for people to, to build good relationships? Are you rooting for Cindy to get that job even though Cindy is on your last nerve? Because all that matters is are you loving people from your insides? And your insides are all that counts. Pastor Pat, uh, I don't know, in February I was here, Pastor Pat was preaching a sermon um, and, and he started pulling out these gummies. Any, was anybody, raise your hand if you were here for this illustration where he's eating gummies. Y- y'all were here, I saw you there. Okay, he's eating these gummies, and he's talking about a bird eating these worms, and I'm sure it was a great illustration. I'm sure it had a great point, but I could not pay attention because all I kept thinking was, he's really not going to give me a gummy. <laughs> like at some point, I'm, I'm waiting for the Oprah moment where like, everybody look under your chair, you got a gummy, like, and he's just eating, and it's, like, distracting because he's not, like, fully getting through the gummy, and he just never gave me one, so I have no clue what it was about. I I decided I'm going to return the favor. I'm going to talk about, and he's not even here, so I can't, like, he's downstairs. I I can't even, like, rub this in, but I'm going to talk about one of my favorite candies really quick. Uh, This is lint chocolate. This is what we call bougie chocolate, Okay. Uh, it's, 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 it's an bougie wrapper. It's way too expensive. I don't know. This is like 59 cents just for one of these things. Okay. And this is my favorite kind. This is hazelnut. Okay. Now here's what I'm, t- here's what I'm telling you about this. The outside is, is kind of important. Like it's, it's, it's good looking. If you're in marketing, you know, it's, it's gotta be good looking. Looks matter. It's gotta be appealing to the eye. But really what I'm telling you is the insides are all that matters. Now, I'm not going to eat this because it was super distracting when Pastor Pat did it. I learned from his mistakes, and it would take me 20 seconds to get this down in a glass of milk. So I'm not going to eat this, but, but the insides are really what matters. Now, you may say to me, but Justin, without the outsides, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rot or something. Or, or Justin, when, when I buy something or when I watch a commercial, really what I care about is the exterior of something. Uh, Justin, you're wearing Nikes, and and obviously you care about the way that those Nikes look. And you would talk maybe about the exterior, but I'll I'll do a little magic trick here. A little magic trick. It's garbage. I got everybody. It's garbage, okay? The, The insides are really all that matters. If the insides are counterfeit, the outsides become counterfeit, right? If the insides are falsehood, the outsides become falsehood. If the insides are lying, the outsides are lying. It, does, it doesn't matter what's on the outside if the insides are lying. Jonah here has rotten insides. Uh, he's angry, he's deceptive, he's manipulative. Um, all he cares about is himself. It's really a selfish love, and selfish love is an oxymoron. Oxymoron means two words that contradict each other. Selfish love is not really love at all. And Jonah's journey, it's got this epic book in the Bible. It's beautifully written. His journey is going to come down to, he's selfish. He's petulant. He's a child. Yes, an entire nation turns back to God, but all we can think about is what he does next. 
I love the way that the Bible kind of breaks down our insides. Not only does Jesus tell these religious leaders, you fools, first clean the inside of the cup and then worry about the outside. But it says in 1 Corinthians uh, and we've turned it into kind of a wedding passage. It's more a raw love passage. It's, a, it's about loving people from the insides. It says in 1 Corinthians that you can have, it's not going to be up there. Uh, it'll be up there later. Um, you can have prophetic powers, meaning you can pre predict the future. It says that you can remove mountains, meaning you have so much faith and so much power from God that you can look at a mountain and go, I don't like that you're there. I'd rather you be over there. Like, that's how much power you can have, it says in 1 Corinthians 13. But if you have not love, you're worthless. Ah, oh, God, is, God is so blatant. If your insides aren't full of love, you're worthless. I don't care if you, son, daughter, I don't care if you pick up a mountain with your faith, you know, like, uh, like Avengers style, you're like, pick it up with your eyeballs and you move it. I don't care if you do that. If you don't have love in your guts, in your God gut, in, in the spiritual space that lives inside of you, and you're not loving people out of that space, you're worthless. It's so deep, the way that God brings us to this place. This is also in 1 Corinthians and this is not who Jonah is. Love is patient. Love is kind. This is the scripture now. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Like love is so subjective, uh, and, and, and we use the same word for our kids that we do for barbecue chicken, and we use the same word for our wife that we do for ice cream. And so we've really put the word love into a blender, and we've turned it on high, and then we put it in a paper shredder, and then we put it into an empty beer can with the bottom empty gross beer stuff at the bottom with some tobacco juice, and then we shook it up. And that's what we've done with the word love. And so we don't even know what it is anymore. And so God needs to reteach us what love is. He's reteaching us through Jonah what love is. And it's not Jonah. So Jonah does this epic big thing for God, but he doesn't have the right interiors. And it's, it doesn't matter. Jonah ends up irritable, resentful, arrogant, and patient. And it leaves no room for the kingdom of God to rejoice because his heart is ruining everything. Let me bring you back to the question. Are you loving people from your insides, from a pure place on your insides? Have you ever been to an event, I've done this before, where I've served people? Maybe it was like a clothing drive, and I went to the clothing drive, and I brought my best clothes, and I'm, yes, I'm doing this. And then I put in a full day, eight hours, organized stuff, loved people. And at the end of the day, I sat down and, I, and all I could think about was me. You ever done that? You ever, uh, at, you were at an event, you're serving people or you're loving people or you're, 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 you're cooking for people, but all you can think about is how much you dislike them? What God is saying is this is, this is worthless. You, you can serve God the rest of your life, but if your intentions, if your insides are not pure, they're not good, it simply does not matter. This is where Jonah ends up. Here's the rest of the account. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. He builds himself a little booth. I'm going to call it a hater hut. Okay? Okay. He literally builds a little hater hut so he has shade to watch the people get tortured from above. But God's not going to do that, but this is what he wants. He's like, let me get a little seat. It's like he's camping out for a video game or something or, or like the best, the new Jordans. It's like he, he gets in line, sets up his little hater hut, and he's like, I can't wait till God rains it down. This is where Jonah's heart is at. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. Discomfort. So not only did he make a hater hut, but he wasn't even good at it because it doesn't even block the sun. I'm hating on his hater hut. 
So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked God that he might die. And so, I mean, he just, my kids do this. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to die. I'm just going to die. No, you're not going to die. Relax, Jonah. It's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. I mean, this guy's a drama queen. He's such a drama queen. He's made himself a hater hut. Look, eventually your insides will become your outsides. So you can hide your insides as long as you want. You can look like a pretty Christian. You can, look, you can show up at all the events. You can do all the right things. But eventually your insides are going to become your outsides. Jonah's insides are revealing themselves for all of us to see throughout eternity. Uh, and, and this is why your insides matter the most. This is why it says in Proverbs 4, guard your heart for it's the what? Anybody know? The wellspring of life. God made us from the inside out. The importance is from the inside out. So God is going to take Jonah to school really quick. Verse 10, it is the last, last, last verse. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came, uh, which came into being in, at night and perished in a night. And sh should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? He says, you're so selfish, your insides are so rotten that you love a plant more than you love the 120,000 souls that I've numbered. I've numbered the hairs on their head. I love them. I care for them. I want them saved. I want them rescued. I want them in my kingdom. And all you can think about is the stupid little plant that's over your head because your hater hut stinks. Again, let me bring it back to us. You ever been there? You ever been to a place where it's just all about you? I've been to that place. It's all about me. And I'm doing something where the name of God is on it or it's for church or it's for somebody and it's attached to the name of Jesus, but my intentions are terrible. I'm complaining. I'm irritable. I'm selfish. I want to I to end off here I want to talk about two symptoms that tell you that your insides are rotten. Uh, and I, I'm going to leave you with a solution. I'm not just going to give you these two symptoms. But I, I, I need you to be honest with yourself tonight. Um, if you've been to a place where you want God's love for you, but you don't want it for anybody else. If you've been to a place where you love the idea of grace, but for you, not for Cindy. Cindy. You love the idea that, that, that Jesus died for you on a cross, but you don't like that for Timmy. I need you to be honest with yourself and go, okay, my, my insides might be rotten and I need to do something about that tonight. So let, let's talk about two symptoms. Number one, you're rooting against others. You ever find yourself just rooting against others? That's not love. So on the exterior, you get to church, and you're like, hey, Randy, hey, Randy. On the inside, you're building a hater hut, and you're hoping that something bad happens to Randy. So you got your church mask on. It's really nice, but on the inside, you're building a hater hut, and you're rooting against people. You're not rooting for them to win in life. You're not rooting for their marriage. Uh, you're not rooting for them to get that job. You're hoping they miss their rent check. These, these are all things that are going on. It's, that means you're rooting against somebody. And God doesn't just ask us to root for people. He asks us to pray for our enemies. So he asks us to target our enemies and then pray for them. So not just root for them, but pray for their life transformation. So rooting against people is the opposite of the, intentions, uh, the, intention, uh, the intentionality of the gospel. Now, if you find yourself rooting against somebody else, it's usually indicative of what's going on inside of you, not what's going on inside of them. This, this is a you thing. This is not a them thing. It's a you thing. Do you find yourself rooting against somebody? I mean, this is the definition of hater, isn't it? I'm, I'm always around people that are like, I hate LeBron James. If you don't know who that is, he's a famous basketball player, probably the most famous in, in, in the whole world. I hate LeBron James. Why? Because he's good? <laughs> like, I hate him. 
Because he builds schools for kids in Akron? It, like, what's, what, do you know him? Did he, did he skimp on the check one time when you were, well, why do you hate LeBron James? So if you're sitting with your friends, your friends would call you what? A, a hater. That's the definition of hate. Rooting for somebody because something is going on inside of you. Not because of them but something that's going on inside of you. So uh, do you find yourself rooting for others or rooting against others? Number two, you have no grace for people. This is another indication. We wear this one as a badge, don't we? We say, I, I got no time for that person. And then your friend is like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Don't have time for that person. I have no love for that person. Good, yes, 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 don't have, don't have love for that person. We, we wear this as a badge, and then people root for us to not have grace for people. Um, th there's a reason that we don't have grace for people. I'll, I'll give you two of them. Uh, I, know th I know there's a few numbers here, but just follow me. Uh, number one, you don't understand God's grace. If you don't have grace for people, it's because you don't understand God's grace. You've never really taken it in at a level where you need to take it in. Uh, you don't understand it from a biblical perspective uh, or from God's perspective. You forgot that God saved you, rescued you, uh, and, and you've moved into a level of amnesia uh, where you don't understand grace anymore. Or number two, you have no grace stored up. So all of us have kind of a grace barn, a grace garage, if you will, where we store up grace. So if you love God's grace, if you thank God for his grace, if you pray for his grace and then receive it and you sing songs about his grace and then you journal about his grace and you understand where his grace come, came from, that, that, that's you storing that grace up in a grace garage. Therefore, when somebody comes by and they're like, can I get some? You're like, I got a whole garage full. Of course. But the reason that you have no grace for anybody else is because you have none stored up. You've never received it. And, and the number one reason why we don't receive it is because we don't think we deserve it, which is the most ludicrous backwards thing in all of Christianity because the word grace means undeserved gift. We got it because we didn't deserve it. So you not receiving it because you don't deserve it makes no sense. Right? This is what separates Christianity from every other religion on the planet. Every other religion says, earn my love, earn my grace, earn my favor. That's how you get to heaven. Jesus says, I paid for it. It's free. You can't do anything to get it. Just receive it. So the reason that you don't have grace for people is because you have none in your grace garage. You've stored none up. And if you, if you don't have grace for people, and if you're rooting against people, and if you're bitter, if you're envious, if you're, if you're cranky all the time, uh, if you're just hoping that other people just walk into the road by accident when a bus is coming by, if that is you, you know your insides are rotten. And it's time to do something about it. And tonight, I, I promise God, I told God, I'm not just going to, because I can do this. I can do this thing where I give everybody a bunch of problems and then I walk out, okay? I say, y'all stink, and then I leave. I can do that very easily. So I was praying for this message, and I said, God, don't let me do that. Let me, let me give two very real, tangible ways uh, to clean the heart from the inside out. Um, and here's number one, and it's going to seem really simple and seem like you've heard it before, but that's okay. Receive God's love. No, for real, take it. You need to take God's love. There's this really sharp verse in 1 John. It goes like this. We love because he first loved us. That's the process. We love because he first loved us. So the process is really simple. He loves you, you understand that love, you receive that love, and therefore you give that love because your cup is overflowing. It's a very simple process. If you don't have love to give, it's because you have a receiving problem. So if you have a love problem, it's because you have a receiving problem. Again, you don't think you deserve it. There is something in your history. Uh, there is something in your character. Uh, a father told you this. A mother told you this. Uh, the people in your life told you that you don't deserve the love of God. You have a secret sin that told you you don't deserve the love of God. But again... 
This is the opposite of the message of God. The message of God is you can't earn it. He already went to the cross. He already paid for it. He already tattooed that, se- that secret that you're thinking of. He already tattooed it on his body as he climbed upon the cross. Again, this is what separates Christian. You can't earn it. It's, it's there for you to take. Do you, do you have a receiving problem? Maybe you don't think you deserve it, but maybe you don't think God deserves you. That's the flip side. You're like, oh, I've suffered. God doesn't know my pain He doesn't know what I've been through. He didn't answer my last prayer the way I wanted it to, and so he doesn't deserve me. So that's the flip side of this. When Jesus lived 33 years, three of it were homeless. Uh, He was hated his whole life. Uh, He was crucified for loving, feeding, and healing people. He was in the desert for 40 days not eating or drinking. He went through all the suffering and pain that he needed to to show you that he deserves your love. That he knows exactly what you've been through. So, uh, do you have a receiving problem? You need to take God's love. You just need to receive it. You need to uh, enjoy God's love and enjoy it to the place where it sits inside of you and it overflows. Last one. Remember where you came from. I think that I either smoke too much weed in high school or I have an amnesia problem because very much like the Israelites, I'll get three or four steps along the way and I'll forget where God just brought me from. Jonah forgot. And it was kind of a big thing, like God sent a whole fish to swallow him up for three days. It's a pretty memorable event. But he forgot what God just did. And because he has spiritual amnesia, he has no love for the people in front of him. You need to just go back and remember. Remember the gutter. Remember the pit. Remember the waters. I'm listening to this song right now. It's called The Story I'll Tell. Uh, If you like worship music, look up Maverick City um, and look up the story I'll tell. And it's all about remembering and telling the story. We're always telling stories, by the way. You're telling a story through the way that you walk, talk, and live. But this is about telling the story of where God brought you from, everywhere you go. Where did God bring you from? Remember it. Write about it. Talk about it. My friend Brandon is in, is in the back row. Uh, he's always talking about his testimony. And his, his testimony is God brought him from running away. God, this is what Jonah did. Jonah said, I'm going to go the opposite way that you tell me to go. And that's what Brandon did. Went the opposite way. God loved him. If he forgets that, not only will he not work in po- walk in power, but he won't walk in love. Let's bring it back full circle. Are you loving people? Are you doing the one thing that God asked you to do? And are you doing it from a pure place? I'm going to pray tonight, and and if we close our eyes, there'll be a moment um, for you to respond in one of the two ways. The first way, close your eyes with me, the first way is to really take God's love. Maybe, Maybe you've you've capped God's love. Maybe you, you've blocked God's love. You've said, you don't deserve me or I don't deserve you. I'm just going to pray against that in the name of Jesus tonight. Jesus, I pray against all those thoughts and all those lies. Those lies are straight from Satan. They're straight from the enemy. And those lies are saying that we don't deserve you. You went a long way to show us that you love us and we can have your love. And so I I pray against those lies. And if there's someone in this room tonight who has been blocking your love, I pray that they would open up their heart tonight and they would receive your love. For those people that say that God doesn't deserve me, I'm going to talk to you for a second. God, I pray that you would reveal exactly what you've done for that person. Bring up memories, bring up thoughts, bring up dreams, bring up visions 
Show that person through the scriptures, through those things, exactly what you've done for them. And for those of us, including myself, who keep on forgetting where we came from, the gutter, the pit, the running that you pulled us out of, I pray that you bring it all back into view. God, we want to love people. It's, it's half the vision of this church. <laughs> love God, love people, prove it. We want to love people. Would you bring us to a, pr- a place of authenticity in, in, in that space tonight? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, Pastor Randy's going to come up and, and dismiss you, but uh, it's, it's been a joy. I'm sure the team will be around if you want someone to pray for you. Uh, Pastor Pat, is back there if you want him to pray for you. Uh, if you feel like God has spoke to you tonight, um, there, is, there is one piece of chocolate. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing a fight over it. Uh, no, that's terrible. Go ahead, Pastor Randy.